All right, so let's get started. Um, so today uh, and for the next two weeks, we're going to have a more intensive uh, practice session. Part of the requirements for this module of DB and all modules is to have a uh, you know intense practice as well as a retreat. So in the absence of being able to uh, get together in person, um, we thought we could just uh, do uh, these next uh, two weeks, focusing on the, the meditations that are covered in this module. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. So um, let's jump right into it. And yeah, first, uh, again, just in a, a brief way. Let's adjust our motivation. So to think how fortunate it is that we still have uh, this precious human rebirth that we didn't die last night. We still have this uh, precious human rebirth qualified by all of the conducive factors, both internal, so being a human, with uh, intelligence and faculties, faith in the Dharma, enough uh, leisure time to pursue the Dharma practice, and the outer conditions of having met with the Dharma, that the Dharma still exists in the world, and we have met with the Dharma and met with our virtuous friends who teach us, explain how to practice correctly, so now with this very most fortunate condition with which we can achieve all of our goals to become free from samsara and to attain complete enlightenment for the benefit of all sitting beings, then we must use this opportunity in the most meaningful way. And certainly we must not, um, because we want to have happiness and be free from suffering, we definitely can't use our life in a, a way that's going to cause more suffering for us in the future. And therefore, at the very least, uh, not harming others. And actually trying to benefit others as much as we can. And then although we might want to benefit others, then we see that our, in our current state, our capacity to do so is very limited. <clears throat> and so we also have to increase our own capabilities, increase our inner qualities, so that we can be of more and more benefit to others. And we're going to do that by training our minds in the graduated path to enlightenment, the Lamrim. So all the various stages of practice laid out sequentially to take us from our current state all the way to the state of Buddhahood. And therefore, in this session, we're going to uh, meditate on Lamrim. So we can gradually traverse these various stages of the path. So just, uh, you know, really get that motivation quite clear in your mind. Uh, 
Okay, so now we'll continue with um, let's see here. Okay, though we haven't done it yet, um, we're going to do some preliminary prayers. So we're going to cover this later in the module of um, establishing a daily practice. Uh, but, uh, you know, to really, uh, you know, as it is said, uh, just as if one is interested in making a harvest, right, having a good harvest, one will first take care of the field. So removing, uh, you know, the various weeds, uh, rocks, things that will, you know, prevent uh, the crops from growing, and then also to fertilize well. So similarly with our minds, we need to set up the um, preconditions for realization. And therefore we do some of these uh, preliminary prayers, right? So always we uh, take refuge in generate bodhicitta. And so now here in the meditation context, then mm, we do similar to uh, what we do in teachings. We visualize uh, our guru in the aspect of Shakyamuni Buddha in the space in front of us. We visualize the, the place that we're meditating as being a pure land of the Buddha. And then we visualize all the sending beings in the space around us. And we can think we're leading them in the, the practice. So then especially, uh, you know, taking a moment to recall the qualities of our guru, the, the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. So, you know, you can visualize Shakyamuni Buddha about two meters in front of you in, in the normal aspect of, uh, you know, sitting, begging bowl in the lap, right hand uh, in the earth touching mudra. And then we uh, take refuge means to recommit ourselves to training in the path laid out by the Buddha. So we can recite this verse here. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha Dharma and the Supreme Assembly by my merits of generosity and so forth. May I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits of generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By my merits of generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit transmigratory beings. Well, then we can... Just do the short version here of the four measurables. So again, not just reciting the words, but I'm trying to cultivate this uh, wish uh, for all sinning beings to have happiness and be free from suffering and so forth. May all sinning beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. So we'll pause after each one try to at least have a, a small mental transformation as the words sort of sink into your mind. May all sitting beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering.
May all sinning beings never be separated from the happiness that knows no suffering. May all sinning beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment and hatred for those held close and distant. Okay, so next, the so-called seven limb prayer. Again, uh, within this, it contains, uh, you know, various uh, different thoughts that we're trying to uh, cultivate. So again, not just leaving it as on the words, um, but try to really encapsulate uh, the, the mind that um, holds on to the meaning. So each seven, uh, it is said, has a specific antidote to an, an affliction and uh, leads to a different uh, kind of positive uh, effect for us. <clears throat> I prostrate reverently with my body, speech, and mind. So, you know, you can visualize prostrating with countless bodies, filling the entire universe. I present clouds of every type of offering, both actually arranged and mentally emanated. So you can think of the offerings you have at your uh, altar, at the center, and then the, the mentally emanated offerings, you can just visualize the whole universe filled with you know, countless uh, wish fulfilling jewels. Everything is precious. And even better to think that you're offering your practice, all the good activities you've been engaged in. That's what really pleases the Buddhas. I confess all my negative actions and downfalls collected from beginning this time. Here, just taking a moment to try to recall all those negative actions we've done. And not just in this life, but from beginning this time. And especially the, the broken vows. And all the times we have displeased our spiritual friend by not following the advice. I rejoice in the virtues of ordinary beings and aryas. So here we'll take even more time. This is a very important practice. It is said, you know, by rejoicing in the virtues of others, uh, then, you know, we accumulate, as it were, a share of uh, the virtues. So first, starting with yourself, recalling all of the, the virtue, all the good deeds, that one has done in the past and generating this mind, how wonderful it is 
that I have practiced virtue. Why? Because it's going to lead to uh, good effects in the future. And especially these actions we undertake with the mind of Bodhicitta, then will become the cause for our future enlightenment. So generate this, this internal feeling of joy, recalling our uh, past good activities. Then we can uh, move on and, and rejoice in the virtues of others. So here it says ordinary beings and aryas. So ordinary beings means those who do not have realization of emptiness. Nonetheless, uh, even without the realization, direct realization of emptiness, then we see in the world, of course, we don't know who's realized emptiness or not. But we still see so much good being done in the world. Sometimes it might be difficult when we're, uh, you know, bombarded with all, all this uh, good news or uh, bad news that we see. Uh, but if we look for it, if we reflect a bit deeper, we see still so much good being done. So just recall that. You know, we can think, uh, you know, even in a non-Adama context, then all, uh, all the, the charitable works being done. You can think, you know, in the very difficult regions in the world, you know, all those millions of uh, refugees uh, from the war in Ukraine, different wars and conflicts, and all the people who are now uh, helping. All those helping those who are sick and injured. All those helping those who are hungry and destitute. So just thinking how wonderful it is that, uh, you know, there's still so many beings engaged in benefiting others. Then continuing on and putting it in the, the sort of Dharma context and thinking of uh, the, the beings who, you know, uh, are striving on the path to liberation and enlightenment and therefore have attained some level of qualities. So even the beings on the Shravaka path, the Pratika Buddha path, have generated the, the mind of renunciation. No longer under the lure of attraction to the marvels of samsara. And then, you know, keeping pure morality, engaging in the three higher trainings, realizing emptiness. And then, of course, the bodhisattvas as well. Every one of their actions motivated by this wish of bodhicitta and therefore training so hard in the six perfections 
traversing the Bodhisattva grounds. And then we can think of, you know, the Buddhas as well, who have completely traversed the path to enlightenment. Think how wonderful it is that they have done that and all the benefit they're giving to others through their teaching. Okay, so you know, Lama Sankaba, he is famously you know, has said, you know, the easiest way to collect a uh, great store of virtue with uh, little effort is the practice of rejoicing. So uh, it's something we should really try to cultivate on a, uh, as much as we can, right? So next, uh, requesting the Buddhas remain, our teachers remain. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence. There we visualize offering a, a throne um, marked with a, a cross to Vajra, which the Buddha, our guru, accepts and agrees to remain. Turn the wheel of, and turn the wheel of Dharma for transmigratory beings. Here we visualize offering a Dharma chakra. Not just one, but countless. And the guru accepts and also accepts our request to teach. I dedicate my own and others' virtues to great enlightenment. So next, the mandala offering. <clears throat> this ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine as a blended land and offer, may all transmigratory beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Rama Mandala Kam Niratayami. Okay. So now we'll continue the session with uh, Foundation of Good Qualities. And we'll start from the beginning. We've covered a lot of these topics, so we'll do it. Uh, you know, from the beginning, it'll be a review. And then at the main sort of body of our practice, the faults of samsara, we will I'll pause at that stanza. So again, you know, we have still the visualization of the Buddha in front of us, our guru and aspect of Shakyamuni Buddha. And then this uh, prayer here, the foundation of all good qualities, it is uh, like a requesting prayer. So we're, we're requesting these uh, various realizations on the path to enlightenment from our guru. The foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect guru. 
correctly. Following the guru is the root of the path. By my clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please best me to rely upon the guru with great respect. Once I have discovered that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once, is extremely difficult to find again and is greatly meaningful, please bless me to generate, unceasingly generate the mind, taking its essence day and night. This body and life are changing like a water bubble. Remember how quickly they perish and death comes. After death, just like a shadow follows the body, the results of black and white karma follow. Once I have found definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be conscientious in abandoning even the slightest collection of shortcomings and accomplishing all virtuous deeds. When I have recognized the shortcomings of samsaric perfections, there is no satisfaction in enjoying them. They are the door to all suffering and they cannot be trusted. Please bless me to generate a strong wish for the bliss of liberation. Okay. So as we mentioned um, before, you know, when we uh, do our daily practice, right? It's very good to go through a Lamrim prayer like this, foundation of all good qualities. And just as we did today, you know, sort of go through what they call a glance meditation, right? So just kind of reviewing the stages of the path, right? Bring them to mind. Uh, but then we uh, choose one topic to do a sort of deep dive um, that we then, you know, um, can go through the uh, various stages in more detail. So we choose one to focus on in each session. So here we'll do, uh, stop at this verse. And um, yeah, so here, recognize the shortening of the various drawbacks of suffering. Okay. So here, um, no satisfaction in enjoying them, door to all suffering cannot be trusted. It just lists a few, but we know from uh, what we studied in the module, we have the so-called six types of suffering, eight types of suffering, three types of suffering. And so, hold on. Let us just switch a bit here. Okay. Okay. 
so uh, again, uh, I was like, oh, shoot. You set the context, right? Mm. Okay, somehow I can't get the, the, the view, right? But anyway, mm, here we go. So just remembering, sending the context, right? We have training the stages with a person, share with the person in meeting capacity. We have the mind intent on liberation, then developing that mind. This is what we saw from the three principles of the path. Without the complete intention, definitely to be free from circling. There is no way to pacify attachment, seeking pleasurable effects in the ocean of circling. Also by craving for psychic existence, embodied beings are continuously bound. Therefore, at the beginning, seek renunciation, right? So the one thing I wanted to mention here, um, all right, we have to keep in mind the big picture. So we're gonna meditate on these faults of samsara, right? To pacify this attachment seeking the pleasurable effects in the ocean of circling, right? So why? Uh, you know, like, um, it's like the, the, the concept of opportunity cost, right? In economics, they talk about opportunity cost. So if we are spending our effort in uh, going after the pleasurable effects in the ocean of circling, what is that doing? Then that means we're not putting effort in our uh, practice seeking uh, renunciation, right? Uh, there's a Kadampa who, uh, saying uh, that, you know, one cannot sew with a two-pointed needle, right? What that means is, you know, uh, we can't uh, pursue these two goals, right? Uh, we have to uh, sort of, uh, you know, choose. And therefore, uh, given these two options, whether to attain pleasurable effects within samsara or to get liberation from samsara, then when we weigh these two options, if we focus on the kind of drawbacks, the problematic nature of samsaric suffering, then that'll help us to generate this wish. Oh, yes, I must definitely be free from samsara now that I've, I've identified all of these uh, drawbacks, okay? So then we have this uh, reflection on the truth of suffering and first we'll do the uh, six uh, types of suffering, right? And um, here, what, what I like to do, so to be very practical, um, Right. So I know, you know, we're, we're a little bit beginners, right? So maybe we don't have everything memorized. But one thing we can just do as we do our meditation session at home, we can actually have, uh, you know, our, our, our books in front of us, right? Read um, the relevant sections in, say, Lamarim Chenma. And then after you read a, a paragraph or a few lines, sort of pause and do our meditation that way. Oops. So I thought we could do that here. I'm gonna open up uh, Lamarim Chenmo. Okay. So here we have the six types of suffering. Okay. So first, uh, the fault of uncertainty. Okay. Now, if you had more time, <clears throat> you can read everything. But what's nice about Lamarin Chenmo, then you have these uh, nice quotations. And then just in these uh, individual stanzas, you can get the sort of point, right? So here, the first fault of uncertainty. As you path that pass through cycle existence, close relatives such as your father and mother becomes your enemies in other lifetimes, while enemies become close relatives. Similarly, your father becomes your son, your son, your father, 
mother becomes your wife, your wife, your mother. Since there is nothing but a succession of such transformations, there is nothing you can count on. <clears throat> Here the friendly letter by Nagarjuna. For those in cycle existence, there is no certainties because fathers become sons, mothers become wives, friend, enemies become friends, and the converse happens as well. Then, even in this life, enemies become friends and vice versa. The Tantra requested by Suba, who says, within a short space of time, an enemy can become a friend and a friend can become an enemy. Likewise, either one may become indifferent, while those who are indifferent may become enemies or intimate friends. Knowing this, the wise never form attachments. They give up the thought of delighting in friends and are content to focus on virtue. So here, you know, we, we meditate on this. Okay. So here again, how we meditate, right? We know these, th this concept, right? <clears throat> so now we have to relate it to our own life. So we'll take a, a few minutes, pause, think about this concept of the mm, these relationships that we have constantly being in flux try to recall specific instances from your own life you know uh, how many times did you fall in love or you know uh, how many times did you break up afterwards you know and um, really try to come to that conclusion that oh yes these uh, relationships are uncertain, they're unstable, they're constantly changing in nature. Then when you get that sort of realization, when you come to that conclusion, when you have that little aha moment, then rest your mind in that. So let's do that for... Mm, a few minutes, say three minutes.
So now we'll move on to the next fault, the fault of insatiability, never being satisfied. So here the friendly letter states, each of us has drunk more milk than would fill the four oceans. Yet those in cyclic existence who act as ordinary beings are intent on drinking still more than that. So continuing on. When you reflect on how you have no lack of experience with the wonders and sufferings of psychic existence, you should become disenchanted. You indulge in pleasures in the pursuit of satisfaction, yet with worldly pleasures, you're never satisfied no matter how much you enjoy them. Hence, time after time, your craving grows, and on that account, you wander for ages through your psychic existence. For an immeasurably long period of time, you'll experience intolerable suffering, which those pleasure, pleasures will not ameliorate in the least. The friendly letter, just as lepers, just as a leper tormented by maggots turned to fire for relief, but finds no peace. So you should understand attachment to sensual pleasures. Compending perfection says, you get what you want, use it up, then acquire more, and you are still not satisfied. What could be sicker than this? One more quotation from letter to a student. What being has not come into the world hundreds of times? What pleasure has not already been experienced countless times? What luxuries such as splendid white yaktail fans have they not owned? Yet even when they possess something, their attachment continues to grow. There is no suffering. They have not experienced many times. The things they desire do not satisfy them. There is no living being that has not slept in their bellies. So why do they not rid themselves of attachment to psychic existence? So here, uh, yeah, more quotations, but I think we know the point. So let's just pause and meditate <clears throat> that from beginning of the samsaric time, we've experienced every pleasure known in samsara not just once, but many times, and still found no uh, lasting relief, no lasting peace and happiness. So again, bring it to your own uh, experience your own life, reflect on this uh, insatiable nature of samsara, trying to see the, the drawback for what it is. And then again, when you reach that conclusion, set your mind and let it sink in. Again, we'll just reflect on this for a few more minutes and then we'll move on.
So we can move on now. The fault of casting bodies off repeatedly. So think from beginningless samsaric rebirth. Then all the various, you know, birth and death we've had. So actually these next two, we can kind of lump together, right? There's the fault of repeated rebirth and the fault of casting bodies off repeatedly. So here, the friendly letter says, each of us has left a pile of bones that would dwarf Mount Meru. And then uh, the flip side of that, repeated rebirth. If you looked for the limit of mothers by counting with earthen pellets the size of juniper berries, the earth would not suffice. So basically, yeah, <laughs> there's a little debate here. But anyway, uh, here, see, if someone took this vast earth pellets the size of juniper berries and set them aside, thinking, this is my mother, this is my mother's mother, then the earth would be exhausted, yet the lineage of matrilineal predecessors would not. Okay, anyway, what that means is countless rebirths. In each time we've taken rebirth from samsara, uh, you know, being in the samsara, we've then had to die. Okay. So, Let's pause and uh, get a slight experience of that, the truth of that. So next, the fault of repeatedly descending from high to low. Okay, it's a bit long quotation, but in any case, having become Indra, the, the worldly of the world's honor, you will still fall again to earth because of the force of past karma. Even having become a universal monarch, you will once again become a slave for other beings in cyclic existence. Though you've experienced, long experienced the pleasures of caressing the breasts and waists of divine women, you will once again encounter the unbearable sensations of grinding, cutting, and flesh tearing hell devices Having dwelt long on the peak of Mount Meru, enjoying the pleasant touch of soft ground on your feet, imagine undergoing the unbearable pain of walking once again over hot coals and rotting corpses in hell. Having frolicked in beautiful groves and enjoyed the embraces of divine women, you'll arrive once again in the forest of hell where the leaves are swords that slice off ears, nose, hands, and legs. Though you have entered the gently flowing river with beautiful goddesses and golden lotuses, you'll plunge once more in hell, into scalding water, the unbearable waters of the impassable river. Having gained the great pleasures of a deity in the desire realm or the detached happiness of Brahma, you'll once again become fuel for the fires of unrelenting hell, suffering pain without respite. 
having been a deity of the sun or the moon, illuminating all the world with the light of your body, you return once more to the dense black darkness where you cannot even see your own outstretched hand. So take a moment, reflect on this suffering of falling from high to low. Again, first getting a sense of the, the truth of this observation. And then knowing that this is the actual nature of samsaric existence, generating that mind of disenchantment from it. Then lastly, the fault of having no companions. Friendly letter says, in this way, you will come to grief. Therefore, take the light from the lamp of the three types of merit. Otherwise, you will go alone into endless darkness that neither sun nor moon can penetrate. So here, point being, you know, although we have, you know, our friends and companions of this life, then at death we must go along, go alone. No stable companion will, you know, follow us from life to life. So reflecting on that, realizing the truth of the statement, and then using that to lessen one's uh, attachment to samsara. So here, Shemo summarizes these six faults into three. In cyclic existence, there is no secure basis you can count on. However much you may indulge in its pleasures, they will not bring satisfaction in the end. And you've been caught in psychic existence from beginningless time.
Okay. So um, let's take a short break, right? We can't meditate for too, too long. Uh, we have two hours. It's been about an hour. So um, yeah, we can take a short break. So if you're in your meditation position, you can, you know, uh, relax your legs. It's a bit difficult. So, you know, practically speaking, okay, I'm going to talk for a while. And then there are some things, uh, some kind of loose ends that I also wanted to go over. So, you know, relax, I'll say a few things, and uh, then we'll continue with uh, meditation. Um, so practically speaking, in your daily practice, you would uh, not necessarily do all six sufferings, right? You would do it like we did, all the preliminaries, and then go through foundational qualities. And then when you pause on that verse for uh, the faults of samsara, you could just take one of the six types of suffering and really dive deep into that one, right? And then the next day, go on to the second one. And then the next day, go on to the third. So you might find that there are certain... Uh, of the list of sufferings that have more of an effect on your mind. So the fault of uncertainty and insatiability of these six types of suffering, uh, those two are said to be um, sort of more, more powerful, right? Mm, more powerful to reflect on. Uh, nonetheless, <laughs> since we have only these two um, kind of meditation sessions together, I wanted to, you know, uh, kind of have more breadth than depth. But just know for your own daily practice, then, you know, it's it's good to have, a, you know, a smaller focus and go deeper. Okay. All right. So next thing, right, I wanted to talk about. Um, so, you know, we had, we had this, um, uh, the, the name of this module, right? It's the uh, samsara and nirvana. So then I was thinking, well, we talked a lot about samsara, but we didn't talk so much about nirvana. And then it occurred to me that um, you'll see in the text, there are these five types of nirvana that are mentioned in different contexts, right? Now, for some reason, when I go to reading view, I can't stay on reading view. So hold on. Yeah. So we have these five types of nirvana, right? So I'm not sure if you've come across these. You probably have heard in various lectures, a few of them being mentioned. But just um, for the sake of completeness, uh, I wanted to discuss these briefly. So the first, you'll, you'll hear this natural nirvana. Have any of you heard of this natural nirvana? No? Yeah. So, uh, okay. So actually, I should first say this, right? So uh, nirvana, right? Sometimes you'll see it translate, right? Going beyond suffering. The one who has transcended suffering. So in Tibetan, ngangyen le depa or nyande for short. Nyang in is like suffering. Le means from. Depa means to transcend or go beyond, right? So um, then natural nirvana is emptiness, okay? So what that means, right? Um, so emptiness itself is uh, liberated from the afflictions, means not stained by the afflictions and this has happened uh you know uh well it's always been the case right so that's why you know, emptiness they say natural nirvana right okay 
<clears throat> and then we'll see this lower nirvana, right? And uh, this is the nirvana that the, the arhats and the Pratika Buddhas achieve, the mere abandonment of the afflictions and their seeds. So remember, seeds, seeds of the afflictions means the ability or the potential for the afflictions to arise again in the future. So these arhats, those who have achieved nirvana, they, uh, you know, it's impossible for them to uh, ever have anger or jealousy or attachment arise again. Okay. All right. Then we have these next two, a little bit tricky, right? So we have nirvana with remainder and nirvana without remainder. Okay. Now, there are two interpretations of this based on uh, the consequentialist or the Prasangika school. And then the, the lower schools um, have another interpretation. Okay. So the, the interpretation actually of the lower schools is what you'll see more often. Okay. Now, uh, let's take me as an example, right? So I am a totally samsaric being totally under the, the um, uh, influence of the afflictions. And uh, so my last uh, rebirth, right? Uh, projecting into this life, it was projected by karma and afflictions. So now my body, right? This is the contaminated aggregates, right? It was projected by the uh, karma and delusions from my last life, okay? Now, let's, let's say, okay, I've now met the, the teachings. I, I listened to all these um, teachings on the faults of samsara. And finally, I mustered the, mm, the wish to be free from samsaric uh, existence. And, um, oh, actually, I don't want to use myself as an example. Let's say John is the example. Because John, then based on that, he's going to develop the wish to be free from samsara for himself alone. Okay. Now, I don't want to take myself as an example because I want to generate bodhicitta instead. Okay. Anyway, so John then says, okay, I'm going to uh, achieve enlightenment or sorry, uh, nirvana for myself alone. John works hard, realizes emptiness, abandons the afflictions in this life. Okay. So he attains nirvana. Okay. Now, he's still in the same body, right? So his aggregates, his body is the same as when, uh, you know, before he realized emptiness, before he entered the path. Okay. So these beings are in the, the, the Hinayana paths, right? Their body is the same. And so even though the, the attainment of nirvana, it's a mental thing, right? It involves the realization of emptiness and therefore abandoning the afflictions and their seeds, but the body is still the same. So their contaminated aggregates, they still have. This is then the remainder. It's, it's remaining. It's left over. Okay? So a nirvana with remainder means the nirvana that these arhats who, you know, newly attain nirvana in that in that last life of theirs right that's the nirvana they have okay <clears throat> so then without remainder let's let's jump on to that we're still staying in the the lower tenant systems so then john after he passes away from that life okay he no longer has afflictions therefore he doesn't take rebirth uh, again in samsara but the mind continues Okay. And then that mind sort of, you know, um, is said takes a, a subtle body or it can take a rebirth in the pure land. Anyway, uh, there's nothing left that is projected by uh, karma and afflictions, right? The afflictions have been abandoned. So then after they pass away from their last life, the nirvana they have is the nirvana without remainder. Okay. All right. So then the consequentialist school, Prasangika school, they have a different interpretation. So remember I was saying, uh, you know, the obscurations to omniscience uh, means that 
<clears throat> you know? Uh, okay. When a, an Arya being, not Buddha, goes into meditative equipoise on emptiness, then there is, an, uh, you know, they realize emptiness uh, exactly as it is. And actually, this direct realization of emptiness means emptiness is appearing to the mind, uh, you know, just like the, the forms and so forth appear to our eyes. So at that time, it, the way it appears is exactly how it exists, right? To Arya in meditative ego poison on emptiness. Okay. But when they arise from that, when you talked about illusion like post meditative state, right? You see that in the text. That means things then appear as they did before, right? Uh, just as things appear to us to be truly existent, inherently existent. An Arya being coming out of meditative ego poise will have the same appearances that we have. Hmm? So, uh, this is the remainder. The false appearances. Hmm? Mm. It shows the very subtle imprints of grasping to true existence still remain in the... Um, the continuum of the arhat, okay? So when the arhat arises from meditation on emptiness and sees everything in this distorted way, that's the remainder. And these impure appearances, false appearances, okay? So then the, the nirvana without remainder, when the arhat then goes again into meditative equipoise and there's no false appearances, no dualistic appearance, then that's the nirvana without remainder. Okay. So one thing you'll see, uh, you know, just to, to make things clear, in the lower schools, which one of the two is attained first? Nirvana with remainder. Right. And then after one passes away from that last life, then one attains nirvana without remainder. But in the higher school, in the, the Prasangika school, which is attained first, the nirvana without remainder, because the attainment of nirvana is coming in meditative equipoise, right? So at the, the last moment of, uh, you know, before they achieve nirvana, they're actually in direct meditative equipoise on emptiness. Then when, uh, after meditating, meditating, that has the force then to abandon even uh, the subtlest seeds of the afflictions, one's still in meditative equipoise. And since one's in meditative equipoise on emptiness, there's no impure appearances. So one attains nirvana without remainder first. Then when one arises from the meditation, sees the impure appearances again, and then it's the nirvana with remainder. Of course, you can then go back into meditation on emptiness again, and then your nirvana is without remainder and so forth. <clears throat> so anyway. That's the uh, nirvana with and without remainder, according to these two schools. Have you heard that before, anyone? Yeah, that presentation? Okay, good. Some yes, some no. Then non-abiding nirvana. Okay, so that's the, the Buddha's enlightenment, right? Uh, non-abiding so here, there's the, the two extremes that uh, one can abide in, right? So uh, abiding in samsara, right? And then there's abiding in solitary peace, right? So it says in Abhisamaya Alamkara, you know, Shepe uh, sila mine shing, ninje sila mine dang. So shepe, uh, so shepa is to know. So through knowledge, uh, C is um, uh, samsara, right? Mine. Uh, so through knowledge, knowledge of emptiness, one doesn't abide in samsara. But ningje, right? Uh, karuna, compassion. She is peace. So through uh, compassion, one doesn't abide in peace. So here, peace means the solitary peace of the lower nirvana. Okay? So the Buddha 
abides in neither of those due to his compassion. Okay. Anyway, that's the five types of nirvana. You will see that if you continue to study. Okay, and then I have a question. So then what is parinirvana? Okay, so parinirvana uh, usually refers, right, um, to these beings in their last life, right? They've achieved um, nirvana when they've abandoned the afflictions. But the parinirvana is like the, the great the great nirvana means then when they pass away from this life, right? When we talk about uh, the Buddha's parinirvana, it means when he passed away from, you know, this life in, in Kushinagar, right? Like that. And then even for arhats, why they call that the, the they still have a parinirvana as well, because, uh, you know, they have, according to lower schools, this remainder of the contaminated aggregates, and therefore, actually, the arhats can still get sick, right? They still experience uh, suffering, feelings, right? Sickness and headaches and uh, toothaches or whatever. But then when they pass away from this life, they no longer uh, experience uh, suffering. So that's what parinirvana is. Okay. All right. Uh, so that was one loose end I wanted to tie up. Now let's continue back with the meditation. Okay. So Out of, out of interest of time, we did the preliminaries uh, at the beginning of the session. So normally, uh, you would do those again. Hmm. Okay, let's um let us actually do the preliminaries again, um, but in a kind of more brief way. Oops. Mm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so again, uh, get back into your comfortable meditation position. Uh, take just a few deep breaths. So, you know, normally, um, if you're doing a meditation retreat, you wouldn't, uh, you know, engage uh, too much in introducing new sort of philosophical concepts. But uh, there was that loose end, I thought to mention. So now just take a few just deep breaths. Letting go of the conceptual thoughts, letting go of everything. Just allowing yourself to be calm, clear and focused.
Then again, visualizing our guru in the space in front of us, in the aspect of Shakyamuni Buddha, all the sinning beings around us, recalling the qualities of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, and wanting to cultivate those qualities within our own mind, and then taking refuge in generating bodhicitta. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, Dharma, and Supreme Assembly by my merits of generosity and so forth. May I become the Buddha to benefit trans and migratory beings. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, Dharma, and Supreme Assembly by my merits of generosity and so forth. May I become a Buddha to benefit trans migratory beings. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, Dharma, and Supreme Assembly by my merits of generosity and so forth. May I become a Buddha to benefit, benefit trans migratory beings. Do just a, a, a quick seven limb prayer. I prostrate reverently with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, both actually arranged and mentally emanated. I confess all my negative actions and downfalls collected from beginning last time. And rejoice in the virtues of ordinary beings and arias. Please remain until the end of Saga existence and and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own and others' virtues to the great enlightenment. This ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, sun and moon. I imagine as a Buddha land and offer it. May all transmigratory beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Ramandala Kamere Tayami. Oh, yeah, we can start over. <laughs> the foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect guru. Correctly devoting, following the Guru is the root of the path. By my clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon the Guru with great respect. When I have discovered that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once, it is extremely difficult to find again and is greatly meaningful. Please bless me to unceasingly generate the mind, taking its essence day and night. This body and life are changing like a water bubble. Remember how quickly they perish and death comes. After death, just like a shadow follows the body, the results of black and white karma follow. When I have found definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be conscientious in abandoning even the slightest collection of shortcomings and in accomplishing all virtuous deeds. When I recognize the shortcomings of samsaric perfections, there is no satisfaction in enjoying them. They are the door to all suffering. They cannot be trusted. Please bless me to generate the strong wish for the bliss of liberation. Uh, so. Here, uh, you know, we have the eight types of suffering. For interest of time, we'll do the suffering of, uh, you know, the three types of suffering. Okay. It's kind of the, <clears throat> the summary, <laughs> right? So we're calling uh, the meaning of these three. Suffering is suffering, easiest to see, the normal things that uh, even beings who haven't particularly studied Dharma, even animals can recognize. So the suffering of the various pains, sicknesses, illness, and uh, yeah, various sufferings of body and mind.
been thinking how, you know, since we've been projected into this world, into this life by our karma and afflictions, then uh, we have no choice but to sometimes experience these, you know, acute uh, gross types of suffering. So next, the um, suffering of change. Normally we think of the, you know, what we call the contaminated pleasure within samsara. So even the things that we normally consider to be good, well, they themselves you know, don't last. They're impermanent in nature. So here again, <clears throat> you know, relative to the suffering of suffering, the suffering of change is you know, relatively better, but compared to nirvana, right? Compared to being totally free from all suffering, then since these contaminated samsara pleasures are in the nature of impermanence and therefore uh, constantly cease, they're unstable, then the relative, uh, you know, between these two, then the stable piece of nirvana is so much better. And as we heard from Ram Sankapa and the three principles of the path, right? Then, you know, seeking these pleasurable effects in samsara then means we're not seeking liberation. So then seeing these suffering of change the things the things we seek so much in life nice food nice companionship pleasant sensory experiences so forth they're all unsatisfactory in nature they will let us down sooner or later
So lastly, the pervasive compounded suffering. Mm. So remembering what that is, the, you know, wherever we are in the six realms of existence, samsaric existence, remembering samsara to be this uncontrolled cycle of rebirth due to our karma and afflictions. So under the control of our karma and afflictions, having no uh, control ourselves, where we are reborn. And after we are reborn, having you know, very little control in what actually we experience, But then as soon as we uh, take uh, such a rebirth, using our human rebirth as an example, then because we have this uh, type of body, then it's subject to being sick, it's subject to getting old, it's subject to die. It's subject to encounter unpleasant things. And compounded Compounded means then also not only has this body and mind of ours been projected by previous karma and affliction, but since we have the afflictions still operating with full force, then we're also accumulating future causes of suffering every day. So really, through analysis, you know, trying to get to that root cause of all of these sufferings, not just a sickness or a headache or something uh, that we experience as a feeling of suffering, but ultimately when we dig down, it's because we're under the control of karma and afflictions that we have all these experiences of suffering. It's because we're under the power of karma and afflictions that we take rebirth in this kind of existence characterized by all the other forms of suffering. And unless we do the work and abandon the afflictions, then in the future, we're also bound to experience these various types of suffering and samsara endlessly. So reflect on this.
when you get that sense of revulsion coming up, lean into it. Let that sick feeling in your stomach manifest. So as it says in the Foundation of Awkward Qualities, recognizing these shortcomings, please bless me to generate the strong wish for the bliss of liberation. So now having uh, reflected on these various shortcomings of samsara, then make the firm determination that I must definitely get out, I must definitely gain liberation from all of these samsaric sufferings. Which is done by abandoning the afflictions. So for now, we can develop a sort of wish or determination that I will not allow myself to come under the control of these afflictions, 
I'm going to strive to abandon them. through cultivating the antidote, the realization of emptiness. Okay, so we'll continue on with the rest of Foundation of All Good Qualities. Through by my being led by this pure thought, mindfulness, oh, great remembrance, alertness and conscientiousness, please bless me to make keeping the individual liberation vows the root of the teachings my essential practice. <clears throat> Just as I have fallen into the sea of samsara, so of all the mother uh, transmigratory beings. By my seeing this, please bless me to train in supreme bodhicitta, which bears the responsibility of freeing transmigratory beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta without familiarizing myself with the three types of morality, I cannot achieve enlightenment. By my seeing this well, please bless me to keep the vow of the sons of the victorious ones with fervent effort. By my having pacified distractions to wrong objects and correctly analyzed the meaning of reality, please bless me to generate quickly within my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. <clears throat> when I become a suitable, oops, when I become a suitable vessel by training in the common path, please bless me to enter immediately enter the holy gateway of fortunate beings, the supreme of all vehicles, the Vajrayana. At that time, the basis of accomplishing the two attainments <clears throat> is keeping my vows and samayas purely. When I have gained effortless conviction in this, Please bless me to protect them even at the cost of my life. Then when I have realized exactly the vital points of the two stages, the essence of the tantric sets, 
and am enjoying the yoga of four sessions with effort without being distracted by non-meditation objects. Please bless me to accomplish these according to the teachings of the holy beings. Thus may the virtuous friends who reveal the noble path and the spiritual practitioners who correctly accomplish it have long lives. Please bless me to pacify completely the collections of outer and inner obstacles. And all my lives never separated from perfect gurus may enjoy the magnificent dharma. And by completing the qualities of the grounds and paths, may I quickly attain the state of Vajadhara. Okay, so mm, we can do just to wrap up. We can think, uh, you know, uh, from Shakyamuni Buddha's uh, heart. Uh, light rays radiate out as well as nectar that enters the crown of our heads as well as the crown of all the sinning beings who are visualizing still in the space around us. And this nectar and the light purifies uh, us and all sinning beings of all the suffering, all the afflictions, all the you know, various problems, as well as the obscurations to love, liberation, and enlightenment. And then we can visualize that Shakyamuni Buddha uh, dissolves into each of us into our hearts and our mind becomes inseparably one with Guru Shakyamuni Buddha's holy mind. Okay. So we have about 10 more minutes. Um, are there any questions? Yes, Shanti. Uh, Venerable, when you say um, then the three types of suffering, does the pervasive compounded suffering include uh, the suffering of suffering or, and suffering of change? Or is it more when there's a neutral feeling and neither manifest suffering or uh, feeling of contaminated happiness? This is, um, yeah, it's a point of debate, uh, actually. <laughs> so, um, uh, to be honest, I'm I'm not entirely sure, uh, and it's something I debated because uh, you know last year uh, uh, my class was debating um, talks about suffering, uh, the four truths. And in that section, it seemed, uh, and some of my classmates held the position that the three types of suffering are, um, you know, contradictory. There's nothing that is all three. And they're saying that the all pervasive compounded suffering is just this, it's the, the kind of continuum of the aggregates that are under the power of karma and afflictions. Right now, if you say that, uh, well, isn't just the, the suffering of suffering, right? The, the, the feeling of suffering in my continuum, isn't that also under the power of karma and afflictions? So, wouldn't that also just be the 
the pervasive compounded suffering, right? Want to have an experience of, of suffering. Well, then they would say, okay, there's two things going on. There's a feeling of suffering. And then even that feeling of suffering, you can generate another aversion to it, right? Or, you know, you, you, someone causes you suffering, you get angry towards them and you accumulate more karma. But that feeling itself, right? Uh, you know, as we said, the arhats, they have a feeling of suffering, right? But they don't have uh, pervasive compounded suffering. So, uh, this is a good question. Let's see if, um, let's see if we can get any, oops, any further insight. I'm now opening up the, uh, right, suffering of conditionality. See here, in this presentation, Lama Mishenmo is talking about con contaminating neutral feelings, right? But it's saying because they coexist with dysfunctional tendencies, they constitute suffering of conditionality, which as explained above does not refer to the feelings alone. Insofar as suffering of conditionality is affected by previous karma as well as the afflictions and exists with the seeds that will produce future uh, suffering and affliction, it coexists with persistent dysfunctional tendencies. Right. So then it talks about right. Thus, attachment increases when a pleasant feeling arises. Hostility uh, increases when a pain arises. Right. So just goes into all this in the same section, right? Hmm? So when you look at just the first line, it seems like it's just talking about the contaminated neutral feelings. But then it says, why are they the suffering of conditionality? Because they coexist with dysfunctional tendencies. It means, uh, yeah, the afflictions, basically. So then if the reason is because they coexist with functional tendency, dysfunctional tendencies, then the suffering of suffering and suffering of change also coexists with dysfunctional tendencies, right? In, in a, a samsaric being. So in my opinion, okay, we're kind of running out of time, right? Mm. When you read this whole section, um, it seems to me the point is um, because we're under the power of uh, dysfunctional tendencies or karma and delusions, then we have uh, these contaminated aggregates, which experience the various kinds of suffering, okay? Uh, so it's this, this reason, coexisting or being under the control of dysfunctional tendencies. That's what makes it suffering of conditionality. Now then why are they just, why is he singling out contaminated neutral feelings? Well, in my opinion, it's because in, in the above section, it was talking about the feelings of suffering. That's, that's the suffering of pain. And then the, the, the contaminated pleasant feelings, that's suffering of change. And so then to be complete, saying, okay, well, then um, even these contaminated neutral feelings, that's also uh, suffering. But the reason he gives is, well, is because they coexist with dysfunctional tendencies. So in that sense, anything that coexists with dysfunctional tendencies is suffering of conditionality, which then means in a samsaric being, 
also the suffering of suffering and the suffering of change could be considered uh, suffering of uh, conditionality. Now, if I uh, saw in another text, you know how they get cute and point of, remember, we're, we're, we're talking about that. The, the being of the middle scope or the being of, yeah, is positive from the standpoint of, you know, wanting liberation from samsara. So remember, we we're talking about that in the definition of the three types of beings, because a uh, being of the great scope, they also want liberation from samsara, but they're not a middle scope being because they're not positive from the standpoint. You know, these, these kind of word games we play in the debate courtyard to, to sort of get us out of these tricky situations. Uh, so anyway, sorry, Shanti. It's a good question. And th this is the thing, right? Well, what I've been trying to emphasize with you so we, we see what's there in the text. And then based on that, we think a little bit. And then we come up with these, these options, right? So I think either way, you can, you can make an argument, you know, because something is very clean in saying that the three types of suffering are contradictory. There's nothing which is the three. But we went through this in another class where actually then the problem comes because it's not just the feeling, right? but even the object out there that gives rise to the feeling. So, you know, someone who likes, I don't know, beef, right? Likes the taste of beef. They get maybe some suffering of change based on that. But, you know, for, for another one, I'm, I'd be you know, revolted if you put a, you know, some, some piece of meat in front of me. So then that same object can become the two for the two people, right? Suffering of suffering and suffering of change. So we saw before that in general, the, the three types of suffering are not contradictory. So I don't know. Anyway, it's okay. We don't have to have a definitive answer, but we have to think about the questions in this way, right? This is how you get to the answer. What do you think, Shanti? Yes, Shantibal. Yeah, it makes it clearer. I mean, what 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 do you what do you what do you think about this question? What I thought before before you gave the answer, Vendabel, is that like this two parts. One is a quality of lack of control or lack of being able to uh, control the outcome, which we also have to focus on when uh, when talking about the suffering. And the other part is, I think, neutral feeling, because when you have three types, you assume that somehow they're, they're, they're mutually exclusive, right? They're contradictory. So maybe it can be mm -hmm. thought of in, in a more complex way rather than what is a... So, yeah, you can think of it in many ways. And they can be... Uh... Right, so you're kind of saying like the, the definition then of suffering and conditionality would be contaminated neutral feelings that coexist with dysfunctional tendencies plus the objects that they view. Yeah, also it can be the quality of um, that we are under the control of. Even in the suffer, when we have other sufferings, we have the quality of being under the control of uh, our contaminated aggregates and afflictions and their seeds. So bringing that out as a specific uh, aspect of suffering. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Just based on this uh, this presentation in Lamin Chimmo, um, I would I would be definition definitively. I would want to do more research for sure. Mm. 
And, I, you know, that's what I was mentioning. Last year, I, I did that bit of research when we were studying Pramana Vartika. And, and at the end of that, I was also uh, quite unclear. So some people said, actually, when you have the, the, the presentation in um, like Pramana Vartika, even though it's talking about the, the, the four truths, it, it can differ from the presentation in Lamrim. But anyway, <laughs> let's bring it back to practice, right? What we're talking about, the fact that we're under the control of karma and afflictions, therefore we're bound to experience, uh, you know, one type of suffering or another. That is the thing that's going to give the most force behind generating the, the, the mind of renunciation. So again, whether you call that suffering of conditionality, uh, what exactly is suffering of conditionality, right? Hmm. To think again and again, you know, this lack of control we have. And I run the control of common affliction these kinds of suffering gross subtle so no common afflictions anymore so how do i do that i need to abandon the afflictions how do i do that i need to realize emptiness because that you know is the the, the true antidote mm. so that's what we have to think about that's what we have to generate right okay anyway we're over time <laughs> so thank you for your patience Let's just do a brief uh, dedication now. Uh, let's see. So first to actualize bodhicitta, may the supreme bodhicitta not yet born arise, may that arisen not decline, but increase more and more. For the life of his wholeness, incomparably kind and supreme Tenzin Gyatso, the wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world. May you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. Then for Lama Zoparimbashe, you who hold the subduers moral way, who serve as bound to the bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunatha's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplished magnificent prayers, honoring the three sublime ones, savior of myself and others, your disciples. Please, please live long. Mm. I'll do just a short one. Due to this virtue, may I quickly become a Guru Buddha and lead all transmigratory beings without exception to that state. Uh, and so let's also do a, a, a brief dedication for all those who have died. So, uh, yeah, some of you might know, uh, you know, Victoria, who had been joining us before. I haven't seen her in this module, but... Uh, her father uh, passed away a few days ago, and today is uh, the funeral. So um, his name is uh, Stanislav Kirichok. So for him and all the other beings who are in the bardo, may they attain a precious human rebirth or rebirth in a pure land where they can achieve enlightenment. Uh, then, yeah, having achieved the mind of Dharma and attained enlightenment in this lifetime. Uh, and then all the beings who are sick, and um, yeah, including Beverly Bird uh, has cancer, uh, started in the liver, and now it's spread to yeah, other places. So for her and all the other beings who are sick, may they quickly be freed from all their ailments, and having uh, completely recovered, may they practice and achieve enlightenment in this lifetime. Uh, and then of course, for all the other causes of suffering, uh, particularly the war in Ukraine, all the uh, environmental problems, natural disasters, um, all these sources of suffering may they instantly be pacified in the world and never occur again.
Okay. So thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.